Next up is Sean Donham. Sean is the Heritage Program Manager with the Chippewa National Forest. Before his career at the Forest Service, he worked as a cultural resources consultant on many projects in the Eastern Region National Forests. His current research interests focus on the relationship between people, their culture, and their environment. He is a registered professional archaeologist and has a PhD in archaeology from Michigan State. Good morning. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I was really excited by the uh, topics that people were talking about yesterday and, and getting more engaged here. I'm a little nervous now because I'm not going to be talking about shells or Florida. I'm going a little bit farther north, but it <laughs> should be okay. Um, I'm here as a representative for Region 9 of the Forest Service, and Region 9's headquarters is over in Milwaukee. So there's a little bit of stuff at the beginning here, and I'm going to read that kind of just focuses on the region, but then I'll jump into to the topic at hand. So the uh, eastern region of the Forest Service, or Region 9, covers a large portion of the northeastern and midwestern United States from Maine to West Virginia and from Missouri to Minnesota. Region 9 forests are situated along the shores of uh, the Great Lakes, along the banks of the Mississippi Ohio River, and countless others of other lakes and rivers. The cultural and historical relationship between this region and its lakes, rivers, and streams is deeply woven into the fabric of Americana. Native Americans and French voyageurs used the waterways as highways. Lumbermen drove logs on the rivers and used those same streams to power their mills. Keelboats and barges are part of the past and present on the Ohio and the Mississippi River, and huge freighters continue to traverse the uh, Great Lakes. The lakes and rivers have also been important for other reasons as well. People have camped along these bodies of water for millennia, and they continue to be used for this purpose today. Likewise, these waters have fed people for millennia and continue to be a source of subsistence, the inland shore fishery in the Great Lakes and wild rice being prime examples. In this presentation, I will delve into later prehistory and explore the relationship between people and their physical environment using an example from the late woodland period in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The late woodland period in the eastern UP began about A.D. 700 and continued until contact with the Europeans around A.D. 1600. The dominant settlement model for this region derives from a relatively small number of coastal Great Lakes archaeological sites and is linked to the development of the inland shores fishery and especially to the advent of deep water, water fishing. Uh, Cleland, back in the 80s, constructed a model in which the development of gillnet technology represents the cornerstone of a series of changes in resource use and site placement, as well as social transformation in the late woodland period. The shift towards the fall fishery was the result of new technologies and social practices, specifically deep water gillnets and storage technology, which are thought to have led to the development of larger settlements of increasing duration of occupation and greater cooperation among social groups. The combination of gill nets, increased social cooperation, and storage are critical to the success of this process. The effort of capturing and processing the fish was thought to require an increased level of social organization, and this leads to a combination of practical and social storage. In other words, the intensive processing of fish for storage is carried out, in part, with the understanding that it will be available for future use to all members of the group engaged in the process. Oops, wasn't quite ready for that. The late woodland people in the region are characterized as mobile hunter-gatherers. The late woodland people in the region are characterized as mobile hunter-gatherers. In basic terms, the subsistence round is centered around two axes, spring and fall fishing. The underlying logic is that people came together to harvest seasonally dense resources. In this case, spring is fall fawning fish. The disper and then dispersed when resources were more scarce, such as in the cold season, or were more broadly distributed across the landscape, as in the warm season. This model was generated based on a relatively small number of coastal sites. Recent research examines data from a larger set of archaeological sites, including both coastal and interior settings, resulting in a fuller picture of late woodland settlement dynamics. The results show that late woodland peoples exploited certain settings and habitats more extensively than others. Some site settings appear to change over time, and others exhibit characteristics of culturally modified landscapes. This paper is concerned with the potential effects of this pattern on late woodland site location. 
There are 81 known late woodland sites in the eastern UP. Uh, the archaeological sites were used to generate an inductive archaeological sensitivity model as well as a site diversity use index. These two exercises produce different types of information. The sensitivity model found that over half of late woodland sites in the eastern UP have been found in mixed pine habitats within 120 meters of a major source of water. These are classified as high sensitivity areas. The high sensitivity areas account for only 3.5% of the eastern UP land base. The image on the left shows a slice of the eastern UP, and the one on the right is a close-up of Grand Island with late woodland sites depicted. The diversity index identified three classes of late woodland sites, extended, intermediate, and limited diversity sites. The index is based on the assumption that different tools were, are used for different different activities and that a greater diversity of tools on a given site should reflect a greater range of activities. Conversely, a lack of tool diversity on a given site could suggest a more limited range of activities. In a sense, the diversity index is a simple scale addressing greater, a greater or lesser range of activities on a site that may help differentiate how that site was used. Based on the diversity index, nine late woodland compu components from seven sites were identified as most likely candidates for the larger residential sites that were used as seasonal aggregation locales where spring and or fall fishing took place. Williams Landing and the Juntnan site have been highlighted because they will be featured in the following discussion. Each of the extended diversity sites is located along the shore of one of the Great Lakes. They produced spring and or fall spawning fish remains, and each is multi-component, including earlier and or later occupations and in many cases, multiple late woodland occupations. These sites share many characteristics associated with persistent places. High concentrations of desirable resources, in this case, access to spring and fall spawning fish. Uh, they also include natural features that, restructure, or that structure reuse, and in this case, the Great Lakes shoreline. And they were occupied and maintained over an extended period of time. For example, the Native American occupation sequence begins at least 4,000 years ago and continued through the historic period at Williams Landing on Grand Island. Likewise, the Juntman site has produced evidence for Native American occupation from about 2,000 years ago to the early 18th century. Further, when social significance of, of the extended diversity coastal fishing sites is considered, they become more than simply resource procurement locales. The Juntman site, for example, includes ossuary burials in the late prehistoric Juntman phase component, which adds to the social importance of the locale. Ossuaries are associated with important integrative rituals, such as the Feast of the Dead, in, in the late prehistoric and early historic periods. Another critical aspect of persistent places is the presence of long-term human occupation, which can alter the physical environment of their locale. Considering the Juntman site once again, the site locale is, is interpreted to have been transitioned from a forested area to an open meadow during the course of its occupation, a process which was, at least partially, a result of human activity. Thus, the environmental setting of J the Juntman site exhibits evidence for a culturally modified landscape. This pattern may also be illustrated by the late woodland site locations on Grand Island. Note that the late woodland sites are clustered in areas with high archaeological sensitivity with mixed pine habitat. The farther one goes from the site, the lower the archaeological sensitivity. The site location and area immediately around the site also include the greatest level of human activity. In case you may think this is a trick of being adjacent to water, the following image shows the distribution of mixed pine habitat on the island. Although the late woodland sites are adjacent to water, in this case, Lake Superior, so are most of the mixed pine habitats. This begs the question of whether there is a relationship between the increased long-term activity of late woodland site, on, on these late woodland sites and the areas that are coded as high archaeological sensitivity areas. Mixed pine habitats are a critical factor in high sensitivity areas. Red oak is a prominent component of the two habitat types where archaeological sites were encountered in the mixed pine group, including the Acer Quercus vicinum habitat type. These habitats also provide a variety of resources that were attractive to, to woodland people in the region. 
The forest secession pattern is conducive to beaver, moose, and warm, and warm season deer habitat. Such habitats also include a higher incidence of certain fruits, such as blueberries, as well as other resources, such as acorns, that were util utilized as food by Native Americans as well as the animals they hunted. Is the relationship then between mixed pine habitats and late woodland archaeological sites the result of human activity on the landscape? There are numerous examples of how human activity can modify the landscape. Small-scale plant management, patterns of residential mobility, or certain landscape managers, management practices have the potential to create heterogeneous habitat mosaics, which may increase the potential for subsistence resources. Mixed pine habitats are the most likely to be affected by natural disturbance and also share many of the attributes of anthropomorphic landscapes. Native Americans in the Upper Great Lakes region and elsewhere modified the composition of the landscape through the use of fire. Low intensity fires according, uh, occurring at fairly frequent intervals shaped forest composition around settlements. The areas that were burned contained higher incidence of mast and fruit producing species that were commonly used as food. While many of these studies suggest forest and understory clearing for horticulture as a primary rationale for the burning, habitat improvement for wildlife and other resources such as nuts and, nuts and berries are also possibilities. There is direct evidence for historic burning in northern Michigan by Native American people. A study conducted by Albert and Mink demonstrated that modern stands of red oak at Colonial Point were established as a result of Anishinaabe agricultural practices in the 1840s and 1850s. Charcoal recovered from plots within these stands were predominantly beech and sugar maple, indicating that original forests had been northern hardwoods and that Native American burning to clear land for planting fostered the transition to oak. Similarly, Loop and Anderton have demonstrated a much higher incidence of fire in coastal pine stands in northern Michigan than in interior stands during the 18th and 19th in, in during the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century. The fire intervals in the interior stands seem to correspond with naturally occurring fire regimes, whereas the coastal pattern is interpret to re interpreted to reflect Native American land use practices, possibly burning associated with, associated with the maintenance of berry patches near settlements. Native American tribes in the eastern UP practiced such burning until stopped by the USDA Forest Service in the 1930s as part of wildland fire suppression programs. Andrew Blackbird, uh, his childhood recollections of Cross Village in the 1830s, appears to reflect such a fire altered, culturally modified landscape. Technical problem? <laughs> so go ahead and read the quote while the technical problem is being addressed. But this points out, you know, similar things to what Anderton and Loop study had shown and uh, some other things that, you know, this environment that he is seeing is a very much a fire-influenced environment. Uh, recent studies of Anishinaabe um, traditional landscape management practices in Ontario show that fire was and is used for a variety of purposes. Fire is used to clear undergrowth for gardens, to facilitate vegetation growth such as berries and other resources like birch bark and for habitat improvement for wild game. Importantly, fire is seen by these people as beings which possess agency and who intentionally create order in the landscape. The evidence outlined above, outlined above shows that Native Americans in the Upper Great Lakes region were actively modifying the landscape throughout the post-European contact period, or after AD 1600. Likewise, the evidence from Grand Island and the Juntman site make a strong case for similar practices in the late woodland period. The culturally modified landscapes described in this paper were created by late woodland people as a result of their dynamic settlement and subsistence practices. The best fishing locations were situated in, in Great Lakes coastal settings and were thus spatially constrained. These archaeological sites were occupied over long periods of time and can be characterized as persistent places. The long-term and diverse occupations at these sites created anthropogenic landscapes, which became more desirable as research procurement locales over time. These were also cultural and normative landscapes, such as those described by Andrew Blackbird and Whitehead Moose in the quotes before. They also provide a good example of the type of maritime cultural landscape tied into the inland shore fishery that might be coming up in a place like uh, northern Michigan. So thank you very much. And I hope the rest of the papers are exciting as the ones I've already seen.